I'm King Lincoln, the calendar is saying October, so it's time for the Humble Choice October 2021 review. It's the same rules as always. I play one hour per game so I can try to tell you who's going to enjoy them and who might want to pass on them. There are 12 games ready to go, so I'm just going to dive right in. And we're going to start with Katana Zero. This is a high-octane platformer with Twitch combat. Katana Zero is focused on players being elite assassins over a series of small rooms and larger levels. You'll carve your way through all the enemies as you go through each area. The gameplay in Katana Zero is good, but it's not a very deep system, and by the halfway point, you'll pretty much have seen everything. The story, though, is what kept me coming back, and I really enjoyed what's here. The opening hour or so is a bit on the slower side, however, before long, Katana Zero impressed me with a deep and thought-provoking story, and a cast of characters who are very memorable. With the gameplay in service of that story, I can easily recommend this, though it does have an abrupt ending, but there is free DLC planned. I don't know when it's coming out, but I hope that addition can satisfy my craving for a complete story here. Pick this up if you want an intense action experience or love Twitch gameplay along with platforming. I gave this a 7 out of 10 on my site, you can of course check that review out, but I'm also remembering so many pieces of the later story here that enthralled me. It is a slow opening, but it is a very interesting game. Amnesia Rebirth. Is this a walking simulator? Alright, let me explain that. I'm not really a horror fan, I kind of dislike the entire genre, I gain no enjoyment from being scared. I played Amnesia Rebirth for over 80 minutes, and it feels like, well, nothing happened. Amnesia Rebirth consistently pulled me out of the intense atmosphere of the game with flashbacks, scripted scenes, and magical happenings, what I called spooky ooky. But none of that was really scary, and in fact the storytelling and flashbacks broke up a lot of that tension. I don't know if I could personally recommend this even to fans of the franchise. Maybe this is what people will want, but personally, 80 minutes without really anything, and having to listen to a weak and forced story that couldn't stop reminding you that you're just playing a game, rather than lulling you into a state where you could be terrified. Pick this up if you want another amnesia game. There is a monster at some point, I'm sure you could be terrified by then, but after 80 minutes of rather weak gameplay, I kind of started to wonder if the game would be able to scare me. I'm surprised this is from the same developer as the original Amnesia game and Soma, both amazing games. What happened? John Wick Hex, becoming one of the greatest action heroes one hexagon at a time. John Wick Hex is a strategy game focused on taking out enemies and managing the room as your character, John Wick of course, advances in the game and fights his ways to various goals. It may sound and look simple, but John Wick Hex takes simplistic rules and setups and then overloads the players with enemies until they're forced to move through the level as John Wick would, slaughtering enemies and moving from each target to the next with an amazing fast combat system. The one thing to know is this is far more turn-based and strategy-oriented than action. And while the game is good, you know, it is a little bit lacking in some areas. There doesn't appear to be any possibility for additional attacks other than special weapons as the game progresses, and the animations, they are a bit weak as is the replay of the level. John Wick uses so many amazing fighting moves in the movies that it's disappointing when you see the same takedown for the third time in a level, or an unrealistic attack. Pick this up though if you like strategy games. Rather than a turtle strategy that worked in XCOM, you're going to have to be far more aggressive here. But as you mow down enemies, you start to feel like a legendary badass, the Baba Yaga of myth. Now this is a prequel to the movies, and while some characters and faces will of course appear, you don't already have to see the movies to enjoy this title. 112 Operator. Handling the emergency services for towns, including your own. 112 Operator is a sequel to 911 Operator with similar gameplay based on the European system rather than the American system. You control different cities such as Berlin and have to route emergency services to different events as well as handle calls yourself. It sounds kind of simple, but it is quite intense over time. The calls are rather entertaining, with many of them being well acted, or at least done well enough to keep my attention, especially the funny ones. A nice new feature is the ability to base the game around where you live. The game was able to detect my location and sure enough put events in the city and surrounding locations from my home, even though I lived in America. It pulled real street information too. That's kind of interesting. Pick this up if you want a strange game. I never really thought I wanted to be a 911 or 112 operator, but after playing this game I was entertained enough that I'm going to return and play more of my game and the campaign itself. This isn't an action game or a AAA bonanza, but 112 Operator was well done and does feel like it's working towards overwhelming the player with the number of different tasks that they'll have to juggle. Guts and Glory, a physics-based streamer game. Guts and Glory is one of those games that developers hope would get popular based on Twitch streamers, you know, overreacting to its wacky, zany physics. But you know, as I played it, I just don't know. I enjoyed my hour with this game, but I mostly just ran generic courses, and while there's an interesting mechanic of being able to choose different characters, none stood out to me. Well, 
none except Pedro, which felt very racist and unfortunately is on screen. The entire game is a checkpoint race where your goal is to survive and get the fastest time. It's a simple concept and there's a lot of different challenges and goals, there's just nothing exciting after a few minutes of it. The goal is to get to this checkpoint and then get to that checkpoint, you know how it is. There are community maps, but it feels like those are just made for insane difficulty. Pick this up if you like physics based games, but you know, I don't know if there's any reason to take a second look at this one, it's just a very average game. Ring of Pain. The humble original demo is now yours to keep as a full game. Ring of Pain is a roguelite where players need to work their way around a circle of cards, dealing with enemies and encounters, and gain to the next room. What keeps this interesting is there's this ability to also go to bonus rooms on the path as well, and there's a lot of focus on stat progression and finding good items. It's not a deck builder, even though it is card based. Ring of Pain's biggest issue though is randomness. You know, some games I lost because of bad rolls, and some games I just made a huge mistake. Though either way, I always wanted to play one more game. At the same time, this is a strange macabre game with a lot of style, and I'm really curious how the game progresses over time. Pick this up if you like roguelites. This is one that is a pure roguelite, so while you unlock new cards that can't appear, the majority of the game stays the same. I rather enjoyed my time and I looked up and realized 90 minutes had passed and all I really wanted to do is play again. Garage Bad Trip, a pixel based zombie twin stick shooter. Garage Bad Trip starts with players having to break their way out of a trunk and then stumble around an abandoned shopping center. Before long they start seeing signs of cannibalism and yeah, sure enough, it's a level based zombie game, just one done in this pixel art style. It's kind of hard to be afraid of the zombies in the game with the art as it is, though the control is pretty good. There is a problem though that your biggest nemesis, at least in the early game, isn't the zombies that can be dodged and managed. Instead, I found myself wanting to use my bullets on rats that are in the game. They can't be punched or hit with an axe, instead they need to be kicked and they take off a lot of your life. When rats are a bigger problem than the zombies, well, maybe that's a sign. Pick this up though if you want a zombie game. This is a nice level based game, there's an interesting story going on, but it really didn't stand out that much. Though I do admit I'm not a huge fan of the zombie genre, so it probably isn't for me. The Texasist, the story of Ray Bibia, a bullet hell shooter with a sort of typing mechanic. The Texasist is a very unique game. You control a priest who has to use his prayers, and it's done through using the left bumper or the right bumper on the controller. The pattern you see on the bottom of the screen helps you go through each of the words. This seems simple enough and actually can be quite fun when you're trying to do a perfect run or a full combo on a boss. But then the Texasist combat starts and you start to see that this is actually a bullet hell game hiding behind that simple mechanic. Players have to dodge attacks on the main screen while still entering in pieces of the incantation on the bottom. It's a strange feeling but it works well together, however while playing it I was unable to speak. My focus and attention were forced to be on this game fully and it's a great feeling as it pushed me to my limit. So pick this up if you want something, you know, a little strange. There's not much like this. It's not a typing game, and while it is definitely a bullet hell shooter, the combat is very unique. There's also only 10 bosses, and the first four had no stage, so I think the game will be a little short, but I have this very strong desire to go back and master all of these battles. I will return. Tools Up, a couch co-op renovation game. In Tools Up, you have to rush through a house, complete major renovations, mostly wallpapering and then flooring in just minutes, and then clean up after yourself. It's an extremely fast and hectic game, and you can work with up to three friends, and I'd actually recommend that. It's similar to Moving Out or Overcooked, where you have to work as a team. Tools Up, though, is a bit easy. My daughter and I got three stars on six or seven levels in just an hour. We had a lot of fun doing it, we also got a little snippy of course, but we enjoyed ourselves, that's what matters. However, the single player is going to be a far weaker experience and I'd probably say this is only for co-op. Pick this up if you want a local co-op game. If you've already played Moving Out or Overcooked, you know what to expect here. Hectic and frantic actions will occur while trying to beat a time limit, but there is a reasonable challenge in the game and it seems like there's a pretty good level set here. Hive Swap Friends Sim. It's Homestuck, and if you don't know what that means, beware. In March 2021, Humble Choice contained Pester Quest, the sequel to this game. It focused on telling odd stories in a style from a website called MS Paint Adventures. The comic is known as Homestuck. It has over 8,000 pages, tons of spin offs, and two games. Now, my understanding is Hive Swap Friends Sim is exactly what Homestuck fans wanted. Just like Pester Quest, though, I really can't fathom a reason it's in the Humble Choice. 
I get that this is popular with the Homestuck fans, but people who want this should already have it to support the creator. This isn't the type of writing that people are going to stumble upon and instantly become fans of, or at least they would already be fans of Homestuck, I think. But worse, I said all of this with PestaQuest, it's even more true of this title. Pick this up if... I mean, you like Homestuck, I guess. But I'd also say not to buy the humble choice for it. Really, go support the creator so you can use your voice and wallet to say, give me more stuff like this. Honestly, I can't recommend this to anyone who doesn't already know what this style is, and likely already has it. I couldn't last more than 30 minutes with this title, and that's like 15 minutes too much. I know there is a fan base for it, it's just not something I enjoy. Black Future 88, a roguelite focused on platforming and guns. Black Future 88 has a great art style. It looks slick and futuristic even though it's set in the year of 1988 or sometime around there because apparently they decided to stop changing the year. You'll fight your way through the Living Tower, a tower that takes any items you leave behind and uses it to equip your enemies with better gear. At least that's what the game says. Black Future 88's biggest problem though is the controls just don't feel fluid. A very simple issue is there's only four directions to dash in. You can't use an upper left or an upper right dash, you either can go up or to one of the sides. The entire game suffers from strange logic like that, such as a reward room where you can just bypass the trap and just double jump and dash up to the upper portion. You also have only 18 minutes to live each game, so this is probably going to be a very short rogue light, at least per run. Pick this up if, honestly, if you somehow didn't get Neon Abyss last month. As I played this game, I realized I should just switch to Neon Abyss. It was a much better game in every way, and that's likely because it came out the year after Black Future. Black Future is just an average or below average rogue light, but in such a crowded genre, it needs to be better than average. Siberia 3. We end up in what feels like the oldest game. Siberia 3 looks and plays like it's from the early 2000s. The first game in the series was actually released in 2002, the second one was released in 2004, and this one was 2017 on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Wait, what? I seriously can't believe it. This feels like an old point and click adventure game and it looks really dated. It's an interesting game, but it's going to be hard for anyone to approach this as something new. And yet, I enjoyed this. The experience reminded me of very old point and click adventure games and there's something strange about such an old style of game being released only four years ago, actually without Kickstarter. Though, the game doesn't appear to recap either the previous two titles and just starts on a strange story of being trapped in a hospital. Pick this up if you really like old point and click adventure games, but you're going to have to accept a lot of jankiness here. I honestly think this should have been all three games in the Siberia trilogy to get re people ready for the new Siberia game coming out in December, because jumping into the middle of the story here is a very strange experience. So with 12 games out of the way, we now have to tackle the humble original. Oh boy. The Grounds. Now, I actually originally wrote a very harsh review of this game, and I've actually gotten some more information. Apparently, The Grounds is one of two games Humble commissioned with 2K Games through a group called Gameheads. That's actually a noble effort, but honestly, something went wrong here. This feels like an incomplete game. Nothing really works right here. There are three playable characters. The arcade mode is broken, I think. I believe you're supposed to have a team of four, yet only one character appears. You just cycle through the opponents, and that's about it. I could go far deeper and further, but I hope it's clear what I'm thinking. Don't pick this up. There was a free version available online, it's disappeared in the last 24 hours, but in general, you know, something went wrong with this game, and the developers are just students, I understand, it's not really their fault in my opinion. I blame Gameheads and Humble for not working to finish this project, or polish the game, which is actually the important part of game development that they should learn. But you know, I had to get all this information secondhand, and there was a piece of criticism that Bomchi would call out every month, with them ending their coverage, I'm going to be picking up the standard, at least for this month. Humble, you failed this game. Not only did you fail to work with the team to polish the game, you also released this game with zero information, just here's a file. You need to start putting out small blurbs on the Humble originals because this was an interesting story of the developers. Why did someone else have to research this? In fact, I didn't even know this. Uh, thank you Biohazard Battle for giving me the information. So with that said, what about this bundle? Well, let's start with the always important. Four of these games have actually been bundled before, two of them by Humble themselves. Guts and Glory and The Texasist have been in different weekly bundles on Humble. Siberia 3 and The Garage Bad Trip have actually been sold elsewhere in bundle. Fanatical. Uh, also, The Texasist was free on Epic. I have it in my library there, and Tools Up was previously on Twitch Prime last month. I have that as well. 
But there's also a bigger issue I have here. There's an idea that you should have like a big game every bundle, the headliner as it's called, but really it's the reason to buy it. It's usually split up over the first three games. You know, Katana Zero is a rather cheap game to be a headliner. It's been out for a long time. Amnesia Rebirth could be it, but I don't know if people are going to be super excited for that one, even fans of that series. And John Wick Hex was interesting, but it actually has all the same issues of Katana Zero, kind of being cheap. But even if there wasn't a headliner, I'm going to admit it. I like the selection. I'm going to be playing three of these games, uh, Ring of Pain, 112 Operator, and The Texorcist. Is that my top three? Well, no. But it's the games I enjoyed the most, the ones I want to play more of. And I thought there was actually a lot of variety here. If you're willing to tackle more indie titles, you're actually going to find some good bargains here, though admittedly this is definitely on the lower end of acceptable for myself and I am judging it at the $12 range. But I also want to fully accept that I like oddball games so that's me rather than seeing the same genre a thousand times. Speaking of which, Rogue Lights, Humble, you know, credit to you. You actually only gave us two this month though with it being October I'm kind of surprised you didn't go a little heavier in the scary games. Maybe Amnesia and Garage are supposed to be it but I think you could have done better there. Anyways, let's talk about the strongest and the weakest of the month. Starting with the third weakest of this month, which is Guts and Glory. Now, there was a lot of average games this month, but Guts and Glory feels like it's capitalizing on a gimmick. It's also a 3D version of a 2D style game called Happy Wheels. That's actually free on the internet. I'll throw a link in the description. The second weakest of this month is Hive Swap Friend Sim. It's Homestuck, and I know someone's going to want this. I also think it's clear that I don't think it's a very good choice for Humble. It's the second time they pulled this. You know, why, Humble? Did you really think this would be popular, or do you have to reach 12 games and this is all you could find? Speaking of, the weakest of this month is... The Grounds. To the developers, I hope you understand why I'm disappointed and why it's in this list. You have a passion, you should use that passion, polish this game, or deliver an amazing second game. This isn't your failing in my mind, but rather whatever process said this title should ship in this state. I feel like someone failed you, and it's such a shame. And with that said, let's go to the strongest. And I'll be honest, I'm specifically not ranking Amnesia Rebirth. I really don't know where it would go. The fifth strongest this month is John Wick Hex. This should go higher. I like Mike Bithell and his games, especially Thomas Was Alone. I like John Wick. I like the gameplay here, but the average animations just drags this experience down. Liked it, but didn't love it. The fourth strongest of this month is Tools Up. It's been a while since we've had a good local co-op game, and Tools Up is pretty fun. It's colorful, inventive, and clever, and honestly, I'm hoping to play more. It also would be really fun to play with a child if you need something to play with them. It's not extremely complex, which is very good. The third strongest of this month is The Texasist, the story of Ray Bibia. I really like this one, and maybe it's just the oddness of the gameplay or the idea behind it, but I really want to see what's happening next in the story. Just the idea of trying to keep up with the typing while dodging a hail of bullets really gets me going. The second strongest of this month is Ring of Pain. I'm not 100% sure on this title, which is probably what's keeping it from number one. The 90 minutes I played it was really good. The fact I want to keep playing it and see what else could happen or what combo I would get next is key to all roguelites. I'm just not sure how deep the game goes. Still, it's a title I'm going to be excited to play more of. And the strongest of this month is Katana Zero. It does have a slow opening, like I mentioned, but it also hints at a strange and solid story. And even replaying it for the bundle got me to try new things, and the writing is just so good. Once you get hooked on this, though, you'll find that you can't put it down, and I only hope the DLC will deliver the same experience, like I've said. And that's what I have for this month. You know, it is a weak month with headliners that didn't really satisfy. I honestly don't know where Humble is going next, but I'm going to be staying on this ride and I hope you keep checking out my videos. I'm going to have my fingers crossed that next month is the one where Humble can deliver a great deal or turn this all around. If you do want to stick around, consider subscribing, ringing that bell, and leaving comments with what you think about this month's bundle or anything else you want to say. Honestly, every time I get one of those comments in an email or just on my phone, it means the world to me. It gives me a huge smile, so thank you very much and thank you for checking out this video. I'll see you next time.